Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our event today. I am going to quickly introduce our speakers, and then I'll turn it over for them to do the presentation, and then we'll watch the movie. Um, so as you can see here in their cool Star Wars uh, <laughs> attire, we have Wade Baker, who is a partner and co-founder of the Scientia Institute. And we have Andy Pendergast, who's the VP of product at ThreatConnect. So I'm going to turn it over to them for their presentation. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So, so thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm hoping we can have a little bit of fun and hopefully learn something too. Um, yeah, now, now the mic works. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we're going to do is go through an intro of the diamond model uh, and give you some background on where it came from and what we do with it and what uh, the, you know, the community as a whole does with it. And then we're actually going to uh, do an exercise to ha and ho have some audience participation. So I know those seats are probably comfortable. Please don't go to sleep because we're going to be calling on you. <laughs> All right, so let's start. And also, I, I don't normally wear suits to the movie theater. That's a oh, slide. Yeah, that's important. That is. I don't normally wear suits to the movie theater. I had a board meeting today, so. I wish I was dressed like a Jedi, but I had to wear a suit. Okay, so the diamond model, what is it? Um, well, it's odd to be like step here or something so I can kind of see. So the full name, diamond model for intrusion analysis, it is an analytic methodology for intrusion analysis. Uh, it details the core fundamental aspects of intrusion activity. Uh, we can break that up over four nodes. We'll go into that as we go. Um, it is for, uh, it was first developed for intrusion or threat intelligence analysts, but we also see it being used quite regularly by incident response and folks in the SOC, et cetera. Where did it come from? So it was published in 2011 uh, by DOD, and we've got the paper there. I think we've got a link. Uh, it's definitely on our website, and you can go to diamondmodel.org. You'll see it there too. Um, it was actually it actually predates 20, 2011 by about four or five years. Um, uh, back when a bunch of us worked in some buildings with uh, at least some rooms that weren't windows, and uh, Sergio Calfitaroni, Chris Betts, uh, and myself, and a bunch of other analysts, we were faced with a problem in 2006. Uh, with the emergence of a lot of advanced threats now, you know, commonly known as APT, advanced persistent threats, they were organized, um, and we needed a way to uh, track them as they evolved so that we could try to stay at least once up ahead of them or understand them, understand what their motives were, find out why they were doing what they were doing, how they were resourced, um, and hopefully try to mitigate them or at least collect information on them so we could uh, prepare others that might be attacked by them to be prepared. So, and I, I really enjoy these slides, by the way, too. Um, so how is it used today? It, informally, it's used as a cognitive model by thousands of threat intel analysts, along with the other models that have also evolved, Kill Chain, um, and especially popular today, MITRE's attack. These are all complementary with each other. We'll touch on that as we go a bit. Um, it also served in its early days as sort of inspiration, foundational model uh, for um, taxonomies and, and standards that have arisen, such as STICS, now STICS too. Um, it also formally can be used uh, to categorize intrusions. It is based on set and graph theory, and you can do this, um, you know, develop mathematical, mathematical equations in there to look at, uh, you know, it, to test, is this activity with some level of confidence related to this other group of activity that I've seen before. Okay, so let's go through each of the features. Um, this almost feels like a pointer, like I could point to it. Uh, so at the top of the diamond, um, this was actually the last node that was created. Uh, a lot of people use the diamond model for uh, attribution style analysis, but that's not actually what we created it for, believe it or not. Um, so it used to just be a triangle. Um, and then we added the, the adversary node last, just because we saw this nexus so often, and it, it, it did complete the diamond, so to speak. So um, we look at the diamond 
as an event. It is every uh, diamond has some time that the event occurred. Uh, it has some person that was responsible for the event, the adversary, um, some capability that they leveraged, uh, be that a you know, piece of malware that exploits a certain vulnerability or a tool online or on net to move laterally, whatever the case may be. Um, and they have some infrastructure that they used, uh, some point of presence either on the internet or within uh, the victim's network uh, to carry out that capability or that they carried out that capability on. Um, so typically the, you know, we can track those as IP addresses, domain names, host names, et cetera, email addresses, uh, your email accounts. Um, and then uh, every event has some, uh, something that's affected uh, there's something that's being targeted, and that's the victim. Um, and we can uh, you know, track those as personas, network addresses, email addresses for the victims as well. Um, what we originally used this for was pivoting across each one. So if I could track a capability, if I could had a signature for malware activity, um, then I might be able to find infrastructure used by the same, you know, by same or similar groups, um, also using that capability in different places. Um, and then if I had some host name that I knew, or a domain name that I knew was related to some other activity on the capability side that was tied to some rat, some remote uh, access trojan, um, then I might be able to find, if I can see resolutions to that domain name or some other victims, that we're also using that rat. So I could pivot across different nodes of the diamond to learn more about either the infrastructure or capability or potential other victims that a given, in this case, adversary was responsible for. Um, and of course, there are some gotchas there. Just because you see a given capability doesn't mean that one capability is only used by one adversary. There's a a many-to-many -many relationship with many of these. Not always, though. Sometimes you've got some very unique capabilities that are only used by one or a couple different adversaries. And that's part of uh, what you have to put together when you're using the diamond. There are also meta features, really just metadata across each of the nodes that are relevant for each of them that we track, like you know, what direction was the ac uh, activity going from infrastructure to adversary, et cetera. Um, and depending on where your um, visibility is, if you're just looking inside your own network, you might not be able to see uh, communications between um, different command and control nodes or et cetera, but if you have kind of a global visibility, you might be able to see more of that. It's important to know where you are in that communication chain or in that link, though, to give it context, and that's what those, uh, some of these um, meta features do. So once you have an event, you can actually begin to string these events together and if you're familiar with the kill chain, you'll notice that this actually looks a lot like a incident um, by kill chain phase. Um, what the diamond allows you to do as it works with the kill chain is actually correlate um, events and activity in, in either the capability or infrastructure across events and, and across incidents. So um, the blue lines here, if you'll notice, work in within an incident typically. So event one begets or causes event two, um, and you move from recon to delivery to exploitation to C2, and you might see different uh, capabilities or infrastructure used as you move down an incident. Um, but you can also correlate across separate incidents at different times to say, well, in incident one, we saw the same C2 call out as we did in C in incident two. That gives us a point of reference to maybe begin to group the activities I saw in incident one and incident two as either being part of the same campaign or uh, potentially similar, similarly motivated adversaries, et cetera. We can also now today, uh, you know, when we started with the diamond, we, we could articulate TTPs as, or tactics, techniques, and procedures as just, you know, context within how infrastructure was used or how a capability was used. Now with MITRE's attack, they codify tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, so you can actually use those as pivot points um, at scale, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, another, so another thing that uh, the diamond model is commonly used for, this is uh, 
particularly useful um, when, if you're an intrusion analyst or you're a threat intelligence analyst and you like to get on fights on Twitter about is this activity attributed to group A or group B and why, um, if you create grouping functions with the diamond um, with certain, you know, by saying like, I know that this is group A because I saw this uh, capability used with this infrastructure and this set frame of time that it was registered to adversary X that I've been tracking for a while, you've got a pretty good case. You can actually call that out in the diamond formally as a grouping function, and then whenever you see activity, you can test it against that grouping function to say, is this part of group A? Based on my criteria, yes it is. Let's include it in my set for group A. Um, and you're going to see um, that activity evolve over time. Um, some of the points might change, and your grouping functions might need to evolve too. So we you know, highly recommend using a, a confidence interval when you're looking at those groups and things that fall just outside your confidence for adding, looking at that group should be then further reviewed to say, actually, maybe they just adapted and we need to change our definition of what group A is. Okay. Um, out of anything, this is probably uh, one of the least, at least the, the technology meta feature here, is one of the least utilized uh, features of the diamond or characteristics of how you might use the diamond. Um, when we created the diamond model, we looked at how um, an adversary might come at a, a victim uh, and how you might discover that activity. So typically, as I mentioned, we'd look at the infrastructure or capabilities, but if there's an unknown capability, you know, you, you've got a kind of a Rumsfeldian unknown unknown. You don't know that they have an ability to exploit something, but you could look at the technology based on an adversary's known intent to get to some action on objective to get to some crown jewel and say where might if I were an adversary look for exploits that otherwise I don't know about and then if you go and look at that technology itself you might actually find um, through vulnerability research etc um, you know, exploits that you didn't know about that the adversary might know about and then you can begin doing some detection and hunting based off of that obviously you're going to have to be pretty well resourced to do that um, so that's one of the reasons why it's lesser lesser used. Um, on the other side of this, the socio-political um, axis is fairly well understood and used by many, um, and that's uh, basically looking at the relationship between that top node, the adversary, and the victim um, to look at what might an adversary want to get out of a victim. What is their intent? Why are they doing this? And that can help drive some of your research as well. Um, kind of bringing this up into the 2019-2020 the time frame, we can look at how the diamond can be used. I kind of showed you um, how it can be used with the cyber kill chain. Um, you can also lay out uh, information or you can use the diamond to help populate uh, the data within a course of action matrix within the kill chain. Um, so that if you know what their capabilities are and you can enumerate those with the diamond based on grouping functions, uh, for a given adversary, then you can also fill out where you stand in mitigating those, and that's very similar to what you can also do, probably a little bit easier now with MITRE's attack in the Navigator. Okay, and don't worry, there's gonna be time for questions. But first, we thought we'd, we'd try to make this a little bit more real than just feeding you a lot of information about the diamond and, and go through an, an exercise here. All right, hello guys. So real using a, uh, a movie that's not, that's fiction. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, Wade Baker, and I wanted to uh, share a couple slides with you. This is based on some fun things we did like five years ago now. It's hard to, hard to believe it was that long ago. Uh, but we just did a thought experiment and we applied um, the diamond model of intrusion analysis to episode four in Star Wars. So it's, you know, that's, 43 years ago now, 42, 43 years ago, so a while ago. Um, I have this shirt on in honor of that effort. It was turned into a, a, a t-shirt. But uh, if you can remember, I don't know, maybe you're like my family. We do, when we see a Star Wars movie like we're about to do now, we have to watch all the rest of them to get it fresh in your mind so you anticipate it. So if you haven't done that, uh, you'll probably remember that episode four, uh, A New Hope, is, I mean, I like that movie because it's all about a data breach. Like, the entire movie is a response to the data breach. It starts, 
that the Death Star plans have been stolen, right? And it proceeds on from there. And if you remember, there's, there's a uh, conclusion at the end of that where the Death Star, the, the, the uh, Empire's main you know, uh, force of power in the, in the galaxy is destroyed. And this is the, the impetus for this question over here. You know? And, and it, as the movie plays out, if you'll recall, uh, there was sort of this massive vulnerability uh, in the Death Star. The, the exhaust ports uh, were, were vulnerable to attack. And if you could shoot the exact right weapon at the exact right time and hit it perfectly, uh, everything would destabilize and it would blow up. And that's eventually what they were able to do. Um, you know, and, it, and it's kind of weird as you watch the movie, especially uh, you've probably seen Rogue One since uh, that time. They kind of filled in that, yeah, the Empire actually knew about this vulnerability. Uh, they analyzed it and knew it, it, it existed. Um, you know, so, so it's a case where they knew about this vulnerability, but if you, if you think about it, maybe, maybe the problem was they didn't know that an adversary was around that could exploit that vulnerability until too late, right? So we just kind of pulled on this thread. Hey, if the Emperor knew that Luke could target womp rats, which I assume is a very small animal. I've never actually seen a womp rat, but you know, I'm, it's, since it's a bragging point by Luke Skywalker in the movie, you gotta assume flying by in a, in a T-16 back home or whatever he was using you know, and targeting a rat is a pretty, pretty remarkable feat, right? So if they had known that, maybe they could have determined that he could apply that to a little tiny exhaust port on the Death Star and things would have been different. So we, uh, we wanted to just, Fill out the diamond for fun, and uh, <clears throat> and we and we did that. So uh, I'm gonna kind of talk through this. Andy, please help me out. Uh, and then once you guys get the hang of it here, we're actually going to kind of try to do this again with your help uh, on uh, episode eight. So kind of take us into episode nine, uh, applying the diamond model, if you will. So um, I I'm gonna start at the victim axis uh, or node uh, on the diamond because it's absolutely clear that, again, if you can kind of put your frame of mind into, into uh, the Empire in episode uh, four. By the way, we are filling this out from the perspective of the Empire, right? And the Rebel Alliance is the adversary that we're concerned about. So we're the Empire. Uh, we would have certainly known about our major asset, the Death Star. It's clear that they did. Uh, if you watch the movie, uh, you, know, you have Vader storming in and the stormtroopers and all that kind of stuff. And they're trying to recover the plans. And, and if you watch uh, Star Wars with your sort of incident response hat on, it's, they're actually pretty good at incident response, they're especially good at tracking things, it seems to me, because uh, they knew who had stolen the plans, they located the ship, Darth Vader and his incident response team were deployed to the ship, um, you know, and, and they knew exactly where the plans had gone. Uh, so they knew about this, uh, no doubt about it, owner Emperor Palpatine, so we, we, we know this victim note. Up on the, on the adversary side, uh, you have to assume by watching the movie that they knew something about the, the major uh, adversary personas, Luke Skywalker, you could extend that to uh, Princess Leia and, and others. Um, they were able to track him. In fact, this is why I say they're pretty good at tracking things. Uh, they tracked, if you remember in the movie, Luke Skywalker had uh, the stolen plans in the droid. They tracked the droid because Luke was dumb and took him home and plugged him in. And that notified him that the plans were on the planet Tatooine. They deployed another force. They killed Luke's uncle <laughs> and aunt. So, so again, they're pretty, pretty good at tracking that kind of stuff. Uh, so they had some pretty good adversary knowledge, I'd say, m better than most of us do when we're responding to an incident, right? That's often a, a pretty foggy area of there. Um, and then in the, as you watch the movies, they, they know more and more about this. Certainly knew about the Rebel Alliance, uh, whom Luke was, was associated with. Uh, so you could say pretty good intel on, on those nodes. Uh, and this is another thing that I personally like about the Diamond Model, because you think about the when you are uh, doing threat analysis, you have to collect information, and that has its challenges. But I don't know, in my experience, uh, assembling the pieces and organizing it and, and creating a story from it that's discernible is the hardest part. And that's one of the things I like about the Diamond Model because it gives you a place to put stuff and start kind of building the picture and the story and organizing the pieces of intelligence that you have, um, even if you don't have the whole picture. Um, so over on the infrastructure side, 
uh, again, I think they had great intel here. They knew about all their capital ships and their fighters, and, and you know, there's nothing, as you watch the movie, that would lead you to believe that they had poor intel on that side. Uh, I can't think of anything that they, they were really missing in. And, and I think the same thing could be argued on the capability side. They knew about the, uh, the weapons uh, that the adversary could deploy, you know, proton torpedoes. They certainly knew about those. And again, going back to the exhaust ports, uh, at the end of the movie, before the Death Star is blown up, they, there's this scene where the analysts come and they say uh, to Grand Moff Tarkin, hey, we've analyzed their attack route and there is a threat. You know, there's a legitimate threat here. We understand what they're doing. We understand the capabilities they're deploying against us. We understand our vulnerabilities and, and there's a threat. And uh, he says, what, you know, in a moment of triumph, get out of my face, uh, we're gonna press on. So, uh, you know, bad, bad decision. Um, but they knew about all of these things over here on the capabilities side. Um, and this is, Andy, you mentioned some of the lesser used parts of the diamond, uh, I think is actually where they failed if you continue the thought experiment uh, this far, might as well press on, right? Um, but they knew about the capabilities. I'm not convinced they knew how those capabilities would be deployed. In other words, yes, they knew about Luke Skywalker, the chief adversary. Yes, they knew about proton torpedoes. Yes, they knew the force existed. But I'm not sure they knew you know, enough, at least in enough time, that uh, that's the way that the enemy would be sufficiently motivated and, and leverage all of those to nail that tiny exhaust port. Uh, in space. So I don't know if that's capability, that technical access there. Yeah, but they didn't get that as well. Yeah. Um, so you know, this over here, this technical ac access seems to be where they had some intel holes. In other words, putting those pieces together and realizing um, the ways in which an adversary might deploy known capabilities. And, uh, you know, in the real world, aside from the, the, the movie screen, there's lots of examples of this, right? Lot, many organizations are compromised because through a known capability from a known adversary using known bad infrastructure, but it's the combination and interaction of all those, those things that, uh, that cause problems. All right, so you can kind of get the idea have to let your imagination work, um, but, uh, but it's kind of fun if you do. So let's do this for episode eight, and this is where we need some, some audience participation. It's gonna be really awkward if you guys don't say anything, so please do. <laughs> we'll just sit here for 15 minutes, be quiet, waiting. No. Um, all right, so here's, uh, it, you, you haven't seen the opening scrawl for episode nine yet. Maybe some of you have. Who's seen the movie? Just, I'm curious. I don't wanna wow. spoil anything. How many of, this, how many of you all right. We spoiled it for you. Okay, we did. How many of you have not seen episode eight? Okay. Sorry. We'll spoil episode eight. Sorry We're about that. We'll spoil episode eight for you. We won't spoil episode nine. Uh, the intent is to to sort of get you prepped for episode nine here. So if you remember what all happened in episode eight, uh, well, let's go back to episode seven. It was almost a redo of episode four, to be honest, right? You had a big giant gun that the enemy had. They were the first order instead of the empire. Uh, they blew up some stuff and the, quote, adversary, uh, now called the resistance instead of the rebel alliance, had to respond to that and they blew up their big gun, and uh, that was episode seven. Uh, so episode eight, the imp uh, sorry, the First Order, who again, we're gonna take the perspective of the First Order, is responding to this, so think of this as an incident response scenario, right? You've just had a major asset destroyed, um, and you know this adversary is still around, and you're trying to get rid of them, so here's the classic Star Wars scrawl. Um, you know, they tracked again. I, this is why I say that the, the Empire and First Order seem to be really good at tracking things. Uh, right after Starkiller Base was destroyed, they knew where the Resistance base was. They tracked it to that. The uh, very opening part of Episode Eight, they destroy um, that base. But some of the Resistance fighters and capital ships escape. And Episode Eight is kind of a one long chase scene throughout the whole movie, if you if you recall. Um, got anything to add to this? I, I think that's, that's perfect. <laughs> In other words, move on. Yeah. 
All right, so we've got a blank diamond here, and um, we'll, we'll help out a little bit with the, with the victim. Again, we are the first order. We are responding to this incident where they've blown up our asset star killer base, and we want to eradicate, we want to contain this adversary. Uh, so someone who's seen episode eight, you know, who, who is the adversary in this case? The resistance. Um, name some key resistance people that, you know, if you're an intel officer for the First Order, you would have, would have been on your radar. Princess Leia. Princess Leia. General. Now General. General Leia. <laughs> Come on. No, I'm just kidding. Who else? Who else? Poe. Poe. Po. Yeah. Commander Poe Dameron. That's right. Uh, Ray. Ray. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, you got to have Luke out there again, right? Because they don't know what in the world's going on with him. But nobody, nobody does really at the at the start of episode eight. Um, so yeah, you get it. They they knew most of the players involved. Once again, aside from Luke, I don't think they had any major intel gaps in the adversary chain. I don't know if you. No, I think they they have. And there's even more characters that we haven't listed here that they would have been intimately familiar with. We'll, we'll get. Um, infrastructure. What uh, what did they know about adversary infrastructure at that point in time? Actually, before we do oh. that, you want to finish the victim one, and then we'll uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, um, all right. What did we? So we knew it's it's the first order, right? Um, what assets have been affected? What assets are they are they thinking may be affected here? Okay. I'll give you a hint. What got blew up, blown up in episode seven? Star killer base. Good. Okay. And what other, um, any other assets that we'd be concerned about here? The fleet. Okay. Good. Keep tracking. Yep. Um, and who's the owner of those assets ultimately? Snoke. 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 Okay. Ooh. All right. And then what's the, so we got the socio political access. So what is the relationship between adversary and victim here? Why do you think the adversary is doing what they're doing? Um, how, what is their political motivation? What is their social motivation? Okay, eradication. Why? <laughs> to put it mildly, yeah. <laughs> Why? The first order wants to establish the priority. Okay. If they're going there. Okay, and, and the adversary doesn't want that. Okay. Okay. Why not? This is a PM tactic, by the way. It's called the five whys. You just keep on drilling down with whys. <laughs> okay, so so it, it, it's pretty clear they don't like each other. Um, they're on different end, like one's extreme right, one's extreme left, or whatever. They got different political views, right? Um, okay, about about how to bring order to the to the galaxy. So okay, so what Wade and I did was we last weekend we kind of. Chat or last week we kind of chatted and, and did this little exercise ourselves, and so you can kind of look, look, it's great you guys against what we did. So I, I mean, it looks like we got we got most of it. So key players up there again. Yes, you could you could put uh, more on the table. One that that we thought of the if you I don't think he has a name in the movie, but the slicer guy, uh, I forget his, the actor that played him. Benicio. Benicio, yeah, yeah, Del Toro or something. Um, uh, there's no indication they knew about him, and he joined the the, uh, the resistance for a little bit, and then was flipped. But uh, uh, that's the one that up there that we thought of that maybe they didn't know about. So, so I think you guys did pretty well. I think uh, the only one I didn't. Oh, there are a couple there, like uh, Holdo, critical in episode eight, um, gets a maneuver named after, and then <laughs> and then of course the traitor, Ben, right? Who's got key intel on the, the first order and all their stuff. All right, capabilities and infrastructure. You don't have to do it this way. You know, you could do them all singly. Uh, I, I, I think they're kind of nice in pairs, especially uh, in something, something like this. But um, infrastructure that the First Order would have known about uh, that the, the resistance possessed. The fleet. Yep. And, I mean, that's the, and again, the whole premise of, of episode eight is they're trying to 
eliminate the, what remains of this fairly small fleet um, of, of the resistance and thereby pretty much wiping out the, the resistance. And they do a pretty good job. Yeah, they do a pretty good like, job. You know, they're, they're down to one capital ship and they're three quarters of the movie there. Yeah. Um, on the capability side, list of capabilities that uh, they probably knew about. So starfighters, we put it technically in infrastructure, um, but then the, but they the, deliver the capabilities from yeah. the starfighters, which are like protons and all. Yeah, 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 yeah. They so got, they had bombers. Similar Great. stuff. Well, well, hyperdrive, very good, very good. Can't forget uh, about the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we put a collection of ships that they were they were chasing there. Uh, actually, the Falcon was off on its own thing, but anyway. Uh, they would have known about these ships. And then over there on the capabilities, um, light speed travel, good, good mention there. That does actually become uh, a play into this pretty heavily. Knew about the droids, voice, uh, the force. Um, uh, and, and this one's kind of interesting if you think about um, the, uh, the resistance possessed that light speed tracker exploit you know, that they needed to get onto one of the Snoke first ship, order yeah. uh, Snoke ships to deploy it. So that the they could no longer track them through uh, through hyperspace, which is why uh, the the resistance couldn't escape in the first place, is because they were they could track them through through hyperspace. So, um, ready, to move on. Yeah, it, it's it's probably important to notice. Like we, we tried to call out the ones that were unknown, right? Capabilities or infrastructure that were unknown. As you know, you're never going to have 100 percent intel. Right, and you might get surprised, or or they might, you know, the adversaries might develop new capabilities as they evolve, uh, campaign to campaign. Yeah. So. Um. Um, so you know, I, I kind of come to the same conclusion here that I did in episode four, and it's that there were a lot of pieces of information that the first order knew about that were accurate. They had a pretty good understanding of who they were dealing with and their capabilities and infrastructure, all of those things. Um, I, I think some of the things that they didn't envision were how those were deployed. But let's let's start with, again, this is an incident response scenario. Let's pretend like we're doing an after action review. Let's talk about some things they seem to have gotten right, you know, where their their intelligence was actually successful and let them do something, something good. Um, I'll start with number one. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they, they very quickly tracked the resistance attack and they responded and they destroyed the, the resistance base, right? Right after Starkiller base was destroyed. Um, I mean, I don't think there's much time at all that passes between episodes seven and eight. We're led to believe it's a pretty immediate response. It's very effective and it accomplishes with the, the, the small caveat that the, some of the uh, resistance escaped, but it was still a pretty good job. I mean, I don't think we usually respond <laughs> to um, uh, something that quickly in a typical incident response process. So I call that a win. Yeah. So the second one here, uh, you know, they were able to look at what the adversary capabilities were, what their infrastructure was. They they had one capital ship, especially after that, uh, after the successful uh, attack on the uh, resistance base, they escaped basically with one ship out, and they were able to assess like how much fuel it would have, and they just created a containment strategy of like, let's bleed them out. And you know, that's probably half the movie is watching them, you know, lob, lob bombs onto the, onto the, uh, the shields of, I forget what the name of the capital ship was. So, you want to do three? Yeah. Um, so uh, I thought this was a, a pretty interesting, you could, you could argue, you know, maybe they knew where the resistance base was beforehand, right? So, so okay, that was existing intel. You could make the same argument that if they knew the uh, the ships of the resistance, they probably knew things like fuel capacity and things. So this could be their known uh, what they knew. Uh, three is a good example of something they didn't know beforehand, but they their active intelligence during this incident response process brought to light, and they responded effectively. So if you remember the scenario of of um, Finn and Rose go to whatever that planet was with the casino and they get the slicer guy to come back because they need to disable the tracker so that the uh, first order can no longer track them through light speed and they can make an escape. 
they manage to get on the uh, on Snoke's ship, and they get right near where they need to deploy uh, this, we'll call it a piece of malware, um, and they catch them, right? They, they manage to, to figure this plot out before they can deploy the, uh, the, the um, tracker, disabler, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and then they, they did even better than that. They turned the adversary's key contractor, the slicer guy, into an informant, and they learned uh, further uh, information about their exit strategy that they, you know, oh, they're going to go to this base on Crate, right? That's where they're, that's where they're going. They're not just going to keep going through space inf infinitely. So again, I call that a win, right? That's in the fog of war, in the middle of the response process, while they're chasing the adversary, they figure this side plot out, respond to it pretty effectively. One of the things we're going to go through next are the intelligence failures of the First Order. Right? Where did they fail to gain information or fail to understand um, the impact of capabilities that the, uh, the sure, that um, the resistance had? And it's it, it's kind of an interesting point, just kind of a side note that, as as we pointed out in episode four, like the the Empire didn't have an intelligence failure; they delivered the intelligence to the commander. Who made the wrong decision based on the intelligence, right? So you, you could argue maybe they didn't deliver it in an impactful manner, and there's something to that. But ultimately, you know, the intelligence was there; they just failed to make the right decision based on that intelligence. And really, the, as far as an, an intel analyst goes or an intel officer, that's your job. Your job is to give information to the commander to let him make the decision, or the executive that needs to make the decision. Um, in in the case of the resistance. There are several points where intelligent, there were actual intelligence failures where they failed to connect the dots. Let's go through some of those. All right, so uh, they failed to implement lessons from the Death Star, right? So they've, they've got, at least in our timeline, oh well, yeah, in their timeline too, 30 plus years of, of history here, where they should know that a light fighter can take out surface guns. Whether through hubris, I guess maybe this is a command command error actually to retract that. Yeah, beginning of the movie, the movie could have been a lot shorter if uh, if they hadn't have taken out the dreadnought. Which right? would have been a bad thing. No, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> so you know, here's Poe looking relieved that he he survived, and they took out the dreadnought, and here's um, the last stink face that this guy will ever give. <laughs> So, uh, and sorry if that's a little bit hard to read down there, I guess, but result is, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't put the pieces together that they actually have a capability that could be used, and this is Wade's, Wade's point here, that the big thing that they missed here was, yes, we've got capability, like the resistance had starfighters, fighters. they had bombers, right? They failed to see how they may be utilized, right? Um, and so through um, some ace piloting, you know, Poe po opens up a window to get the, the dreadnought destroyed. You gotta take this one. Yep. Um, so, you know, this one, they failed to foresee that a cornered and desperate enemy could use a ship's light speed capability as a weapon of mass destruction. So, um, kind of that socio political axis, if you know that an adversary is sufficiently motivated perhaps desperate, they do desperate things. They take on high risk measures, right? And they're, they're willing to, to maybe even throw survival out the door. And when it does that, things become a lot harder. Um, if you remember in the movie, uh, they uh, are kind of down to their last capital ship and in an effort to protect the ones that were escaping to the base on uh, the planet Crate, uh, Admiral Holdo got in the capital ship and full throttle to light speed through um, Snoke ship destroying it and a bunch of other uh, of the First Order Armada. Um, and it's the first time we've ever seen that technique used in, um, in Star Wars universe. Made a lot of people that are Star Wars uh, fans mad because like, hey, why wasn't this ever used before? <laughs> this would have been handy. Uh, in fact, it'd probably work with a little teeny tiny ship that could uh, go light speed. But anyway, um, didn't foresee this tactic. Neither did many people uh, until the second before it happened when you watch the movie, uh, but it resulted in the destruction of Snoke's ship. Yep. And I'm sure you'll see light speed drill guns throughout <laughs> the, the older maneuvers. Okay. Um, 
Final one here is they failed to not underestimate the force. And really, this is Kylo, right? He, he sh he's the one that really should have known what was possible here. He was effectively having force communication and, and visualization with Ray, kind of having this little flirt thing going on through most of the movie. You know, he, he actually had this capability himself to some extent, right? He failed to see how a more experienced, more powerful user of the force might wield it um, to their advantage. So yeah. what ends up happening is Luke plays a, a big distraction tactic here. Um, and you know, he effectively spoofs, spoofs Kylo, um, gets him to waste critical minutes to allow, once again, the resistance to sneak out literally the back door and live another day. And it takes us into episode yeah, nine. And so now cue episode nine. And we hope this was helpful. We obviously we expounded a little bit beyond the diamond, where we want to have a little bit of fun with it too. Uh, so and if you haven't seen episode eight, now you don't need to. So that's okay. <laughs>